Home Bible Study Ministry presents our teacher of the Word of God, Dr. Eugene McGee. Hello, dear friend, and welcome once again to the Home Bible Study Ministry. Today we'll continue our studies in Romans. It begins with these words, Paul, a bond servant of Jesus Christ, called as an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, who was declared with power to be the son of God by the resurrection from the dead according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. Let's go back and look at that for a moment. Paul is an apostle. The Lord had prepared him with three years of teaching there in the desert near Mount Sinai. And there he had received the great doctrines of grace that we will teach you and you will learn them from this book of Romans. And it is the gospel of God. It is the good news of God. He was set apart for this purpose. Paul was a type A person a person with great drive and great ambition. He prospered in the Jewish religion above all of those other young men of his age in Jerusalem at the time because of his zeal and because of his drive. But there on the road to Damascus, he was stopped in his tracks as a light from heaven shone about him, greater than the noonday sun, and he fell to the earth blinded And he heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And Saul answered and said, Lord, who art thou? And the voice said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for you to kick against the pricks. And then Saul said to him, Lord, what would you have me to do? And he was told, Go into the city, and it will be told you what you are to do. And once He was led by hand into the city because he was blind. A man by the name of Ananias was called by God to go see him. When the Lord gave Ananias his message, he didn't want to go. He was afraid of Saul. He said to the Lord, I've heard by many sources that this man has come to persecute the Christians and put us in jail. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way and entered into the house and putting his hands on him said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received his sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. And when he had received food, he was strengthened, Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. And of course the persecution began after that. And as so often was the case, the people in power in the synagogue rejected this message. They persecuted the Christians, and they set themselves up to murder Saul of Tarsus. This became known to him, and the Christians in the city let him down over the wall in a laundry basket, and he went into Arabia. And there for three years he was taught by the Lord Jesus the great doctrines that he was able to write down in the book of Romans. And so he was set apart for the gospel of God, It was a sovereign act of God. God stopped him in his tracks and set him apart for the gospel of God. Someone has pointed out that this is a case of the sovereignty of God in the salvation of a man's soul. And that is true. God does sovereignly save people. But look at the circumstances. This is for the inclusion of many millions of souls. He didn't save Saul of Tarsus to the exclusion of anybody. 
He saved him for the salvation of the millions who would someday read the book of Romans and read the epistles of Paul and find Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. Yes, he was set apart by God, but he was set apart not just to save his own soul. He was set apart in order that God might include millions of other people in his plan of salvation. And so he was set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, we look back in the Old Testament and we see many places where the gospel is promised. The very first one is found in Genesis 3:15, where the Lord said to the serpent, the seed of the woman will crush your head, but you will bruise his heel. That's a prophecy concerning the cross because the great lie of Satan the great head lie of Satan was that God is selfish. That's what he used to seduce the angels before Adam and Eve ever came into existence. And it was the same lie that he used on Eve when he told her, God is keeping you as slaves. If you disobey him and ate of that tree, you would be like him. And this is one of the great ambitions of Satan. And it is his great lie that God is not love, God is not good, God is cruel, God is selfish. This is his great lie. And how did Jesus Christ crush that lie? He crushed it by dying on a cross for the sins of the whole world. No one today can possibly deny that God loves them if he looks at the cross. But for there on the cross, Jesus Christ bore in his body the sins of the whole world and paid our debt guilt when we could not pay it ourselves. In the Apostle Paul, in the 8th chapter, he says, Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, For thy sake we are being put to death all the day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. We overwhelmingly conquered through him that loved us. Now notice it's in the past tense. We have to look back to the cross to understand that God loves us, that Christ died for us. If we take our eyes off of the cross, then Satan can get to us with his fiery darts. But as long as we look at the cross, we know and understand that God loves us, and Christ died for us. And there you have it, seven things that can happen, the worst things that can happen to you. They cannot separate you from the love of Christ. If you look back at the cross, Paul says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. That's the gospel. God loved us and sent his son to die for us, and his son died for us on the cross. And when he died for us on the cross, he revealed the true nature of God, that God is light and God is love. Satan had tried to tell the woman that God didn't care for them. And there are millions of people in the world today who are listening to that same lie of the devil. He's telling you that God doesn't love you, or he would not have let this thing or that thing or some other thing happen to you. If God is almighty and he has all power, he could have prevented the accident. He could have saved the life. It didn't need to happen that way. Many people will blame God for the tsunami, but that wasn't God's fault. Listen, we are living in a fallen world, a world that's under the curse because of the sin of man. And as long as that curse remains, there are going to be disasters. And Satan will try to blame God for them. But they all go back to one event, the sin of man and woman in the Garden of Eden, when they turn their backs on God and believe the lie of the devil. Now you have to make a choice. Are you going to believe that same lie, that God is selfish, God doesn't care for you, or are you going to believe the Bible that says that God loved you so much he let his son suffer 
the death of the cross and that he took in his body your own sins and paid for them. Are you going to believe the gospel? Or are you going to reject it? If you believe the gospel, it becomes the power of God unto you. Look at verse 16 of this first chapter. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. The gospel is the power of God, the dynamite of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. But if you reject it, if you don't believe it, then, dear friend, it is a curse to you because someday you will have to stand before God and you will have to stand there having rejected the gospel, having turned your back on Jesus just like Adam and Eve turned their back on God and believed the serpent. What are you going to do? Will you believe or will you not believe? It is a decision which you have to make, and perhaps you could make it right now. You say, well, Gene, if I want to become a Christian, what am I to do? According to the Apostle Paul, as it's recorded in Acts chapter 20, there are two things about the gospel. One is repentance, and the other one is faith. You must repent of your attitude toward God. You've got to stop believing that God is evil. You've got to believe that God is good, and that he sent his son to die for you on the cross. And the second thing is you must believe that God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. If you believe that, then you have the promise of God that you shall be saved. If you turned over to the 10th chapter of this book of Romans, verses 9 and 10, and those are contract verses that you ought to memorize, they tell you, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that God has raised Jesus from the dead, you shall be saved. And dear friend, I hope and pray right now if you haven't yet made the decision that you would bow your head at this moment and say this prayer to Jesus. Lord Jesus, I thank you for paying my penalty on the cross. I thank you that God raised you from the dead and that you are at the right hand of God at this very moment. I accept you as my Lord and my Savior. Amen. And dear friend, Having made that prayer, God heard it, and you have been accepted in Christ. Look at Romans chapter 10, verse 13. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. You just called on the name of the Lord, and you have the promise, you shall be saved. The Holy Spirit has come to live in your heart. The Bible will become an open book to you through his mighty ministry to you. And dear friend, let me urge you to do something else. Write to me today, Gene McGee, and ask for the first lesson here in the book of Romans. I've prepared 58 lessons on the book of Romans. They are simple lessons. You can do them, and they will be very helpful for you. Simply send us a postcard or send us a letter and say, Romans, and I will send you the first of these 58 lessons. It will take you about a year to go through them. So this is a real commitment on your part. I'll give you the address again. Post Office Box 49404, Atlanta, Georgia, 30345. God bless you, and we hope to have a letter from you today. Amen.